welcome to the Undisciplined Reading Series. It's me, Nico Beitendach, and we're heading towards the end of Carlson's A Pure Theory of Law. Today we're doing Chapter 7. Before we start, the usual kind of announcements first. Please like and share these videos if you can to people you think might be interested. It would really help. I really appreciate that. And secondly, like I said in the previous video, my book just came out. It deals a lot with the questions that we're talking about today, international law and foundational aspects of international law. So if you're interested in this video, you'll probably be interested in that. The link to that, it's open access, free download, is in the description. So having that out of the way, Let's dig into Kelsen. As we said, it's chapter 7, the state and international law. So, some of these questions that Kelsen deals with in this chapter, think about it's, you know, the pre and post World War II years. These are quite foundational questions for the new kind of international law that was coming up. And Kelsen was very interested in those. He also wrote a lot specifically on international outside of the pure theory. He has a whole monographs dedicated to, to international law. And perhaps some of these questions might seem a bit old fashioned by now, like we've resolved them, which is true to a large extent, but you know, jawbreaker says, uh, survival never goes out of style and I think a lot of these foundational questions also never go out of style. So in this chapter, I think Carlson tries to do two main important things here. The first is to establish or to answer the question of whether international law is law at all. Does that fit within his theory of law that he spent the previous six chapters delineating does international law f fit within that that's the one question and then secondly which which follows from that that if it is how do we reconcile that with national or domestic legal systems what is their relationship inside of the pure theory so, on to the first question, you know, is international law, public international law, is it law? Because we saw earlier, Kelsen sometimes has these quick asides where he says that public international law is perhaps still more primitive than national legal systems. It's not as developed yet. So... The question is, given the criteria that he laid out for national legal systems, does international law qualify? The short answer is yes. But how does he justify this? So let's go back to Kelsen's definition of what a legal system is, right? So it's a coercive normative order that backs itself up through sanction. Does international law fit this definition? He says, well, okay, obviously it's a normative order. There are international legal norms. The second question is, are there sanctions? Coercive sanctions. And he says, yes. Namely, at the time that he was writing this, keep in mind, the sanction of international law was reprisals and war. These are clearly coercive and they are employed as a sanction to a norm that has been broken. He makes this distinction between reprisal and war because a reprisal is something where the use of force is not necessarily present. And he says that also kind of on the other hand, war is not just 
pure power or or you know the law of the jungle law qualifies as a legal sanction why he mentions the league of nations and then the kellogg Briand pact and eventually the united nations charter which puts limits on the use of force on war and he says so it gives conditions for when war is legitimate and that makes it so that law takes on the character not of Hobbesian survival of the fittest but rather it has to be a response to a norm being broken so war and reprisals take on a punitive character through the League of Nations, Kellogg Briand, the United Nations Charter. War is not just a fight, it's a punishment, it's a sanction. And he says, okay, but then the second question is, you know, it's a normative order that regulates human behavior. And now we could say that, okay, but public international law is aimed at states as subjects, not humans. And then he says, okay, but this is also not a problem. This works because at the end of the day, what international law does is regulate the actions of humans. The difference is, is that the real actions of humans are not attributed to themselves. Remember right in the beginning, how important attribution is in the legal system and understanding law as a science. But it's it's human action that is attributed to a state rather than an individual. It doesn't matter who the particular individual is. He's acting on behalf of a state and his actions are regulated by this normative order. So in this sense, it's almost like a company in a national legal system. It's still human actions being regulated. Doesn't matter whether it's attributed to them in their personal capacity or to the state. We're still do dealing with human actions at the end of the day. So, uh, Carlson describes this in inverted commas as a kind of a collective liability under which states are the subjects of international law through the actions of individuals. So we see that for Carlson, all the elements of his definition in the pure theory, he is able to confirm that public international law is law. And he also says that um, this is the case at the time that he's writing, but that international law is moving. It's, it's, it's very decentralized now compared to national legal systems, which are very centralized, as we said. But he believes that international law is moving towards greater and greater centralization. You know, there's a, he, he talks about world law or a world government and one or two points. I get the feeling there's a, a teleological inevitability for Carlson in this. This is perhaps also a bit of a sign of his time. The final question on this, whether international law is law under the pure theory, would bring us back to the Gung norm, the basic norm. And where do we find that in international law? He starts with a very hierarchical breakdown of the sources of international law. He gives three levels. He says custom then treaties, and then the decisions of courts and international organs or international organizations. And he says that if the basic norm is to be found anywhere, it can be found in international customary law. He also does this for national law. Remember, he says that, okay, the basic norm has to be presupposed and it's probably 
in long forgotten custom rather than a constitution. So given that we've established international law as law in the scientific definition, the obvious next question becomes, what is the relationship of international law with national law? He says we can understand this in two ways. There are two possible theoretical constructions. A pluralistic notion and a monistic notion of this relationship. He prefers the monistic notion. But first, let's debunk the pluralistic understanding of the relationship between international and national law. So the pluralistic notion says that international law and national law are two separate legal orders, that they are not in sync with each other and that they can conflict. Carlson says this crit critique of, of conflict between international and national law does not mean that they are two separate orders. It's not a good enough reason. He says because national orders can also have internal conflicts and it doesn't pose a problem for the unity of the national legal system. So the conflict between international law and national law also should not pose a problem for the unity of this. He also takes on the criticism that international law norms are often broken. He says this is also not a problem. We saw in an earlier chapter that for Kelsen, the breaking of a norm does not negate the validity of that norm. If it happens too much, yes, perhaps. But in principle, violating a norm does not negate the existence of that legal order. In fact, that is what activates the, the legal system to impose a consequence or a sanction. In short, Kelsen wants to get rid of the pluralistic conception, namely that international law and national law are separate orders. He says we have to follow a monistic model which says that international and the various national laws all form part of a single unified order. Now again, within the monistic understanding, there's two theoretical constructions that are possible. The one is a hierarchic construction, the other one is a coordinated construction. The hierarchic construction places emphasis on international, that international law is above uh, national law. The coordinated construction or coordination construction prefers to put emphasis on national law, the primacy there, and that national and international law coordinate with one another, but the national law is the most central one, the primary one. Carlson does not completely express a preference for either of these two constructions. He says both are scientifically plausible or, or valid ways. Um, the point is that both are monistic. It sees them as a unity. And where you prefer to put the emphasis does not change that fact. Although there are some differences in the details, depending on which side you emphasize. So he goes on to explain this. He says, what happens when you put national law as the more important uh, part of the legal order over international law? This means that public international law is valid 
to the extent that a state in its own legal order recognizes international law. So it places an emphasis on sovereignty of the state. He says, but if you, if you think about it this way, so then international law is in the end only a part of national law. Once the state accepts it, then it becomes part of its own lawment of order. That's fine. The two systems are still coordinated, although they have their limits of where the one starts and the other one ends, but it, it's not a problem for, for the unity. The other construction of a monistic order is putting the primacy on public international law, which means that the authority or sovereignty of the national legal order is delegated to it by public international law. In this case, being sovereign merely means being part of the family of the international order. And then he says there's a, a common criticism of this idea is that states predate public international law. I would add that defining a state is already, uh, you know, not a simple matter. It's, it's debatable to what extent we can say that. There's a good argument to be made that states are very new. But nevertheless, Carlson does not see a problem with this criticism. He says that this doesn't matter because we should not confuse temporality with logic. He says that the, the fact that states are temporarily prior to international law does not mean that they are conceptually prior to international law. Even though international law came later, we can conceptually or logically place it prior to the state. He says, for that matter, the family unit is older than the state, but we don't regard the family unit as having somehow more legal sovereignty than the state does. So we have to think about it conceptually, not within time. So the point is, whichever construction you prefer, whether you prefer placing the priority on national law or whether you prefer placing it on public international law, both of these are monistic constructions, meaning that international and national law form part of a unified single legal order. And that in itself is good enough for Kelsen. Which one you choose is not so much a legal question as it is perhaps a political one. Both only give a different reason for why public international law is valid. It doesn't call into question the validity itself, only its justification. And both are plausible. And he ends the chapter by saying that, like we said, whichever one of these two constructions you prefer, it's more of a political choice or a philosophical choice than it is a legal scientific choice. What does he mean by that? He says that each of them betray something of the person who chooses their worldview or world outlook. He says the the first construction of placing primacy on national law has a more imperialistic tendency where the one placing emphasis on international law has a more liberal pacifist tendency to it. Although this is not per se. He goes further kind of philosophically and he says that 
The difference is basically the one between a subjectivist worldview and an objectivist worldview. The national priority is subjectivist. It places you, the subject, or your state as a subject at the center of your worldview. The self is sovereign. And he says this is almost like a geocentric conception of the world, you know, where the earth is the center of the universe. So by analogy, your state is the center of the world and you yourself are the center of your world. The international law side is objectivist. It kind of sees the world in its bigger picture from the outside looking in. He says this is more like a Copernican uh, worldview where, you know, the earth is decentered and yourself and your state is decentered. Your only part of the world, one piece of the puzzle of the bigger picture, not in the center. You yourself are not in the center. You are just one thing among many moving within this bigger picture of the world. And I quite like Carlson's kind of uh, philosophy of science here. He says, you know, both are both are correct interpretations. You cannot say either is empirically wrong. Both are valid. It The point is, where are you observing from? Are you observing from, you know, kind of like your own skull outwards? Or are you observing from a sort of a bird's eye view, looking down at everything? This is a choice. It's not... The one is not more true than the other. And anyway, where we choose to observe from is anyway a choice. Perhaps a political choice or a personal choice. It's not a legal choice and it's not a scientific choice. The final decision of where we decide to observe from, from our own skull or from floating in space, cannot be a legal choice. You know, there's no legal reason for choosing one perspective or the other. It, you know, it has to be a kind of a philosophical or a, or a political choice. The law cannot decide. Whichever one you choose, it leads to a monistic, unified understanding of the relationship between international law and national law. And the point is, is that you know, we talk about this legal system, that legal system, but at the end of the day, there is only the legal system. And the legal system can be used for conservative ends, it can be used for progressive ends, it can be self-centered and imperialist, it can be outward-looking and uh, liberal, that's that's a political or philosophical choice. But thank you very much. That's chapter seven on the state and law and international law. In the next video, we will finish. It's the chapter on interpretation. It's a very short chapter. It's about six or seven pages. So that video should be quite short. So I think I'm also going to use that video to kind of wrap up and give like broader final thoughts on the whole book so thank you very much i hope you have a lovely week and see you next time for the final one in our calson series goodbye